ההמשך, this lecture, בעזרת השם, will be לעינוי נשמת מזל בת כסייה פנחסוב, בן אברהם בן אפרים זובלי, בן מונירה בת חנה, לעינוי נשמתם. Also לרפואה דוד בן עליזה מלכה. Today it's the third lecture in a series, Foundation of Fate, and that's also will be the last one. That will be a short series. I was planning to do it longer, but then I came to the, to the conclusion that maybe people are already expert when it comes to faith and uh, knowing the foundations and the principles of God. You know, so uh, you can see based on the amount of views that people have on a lecture, how much they have interest in it. So when they hear faith, I think everyone thinks he's already a great believer. Even though the, the exact opposite is the truth, but it is what it is. Last Monday was a very good lecture. Marash uh, Fire. If you came here last Monday, you know what I'm talking about. One of the best lectures there was ever, maybe. But uh, we will conclude basically the main things today, and then otherwise it would be a very long series. I don't want to continue and finish after Pesach. Soon Pesach is coming. We're going to a very long break. I'm going to Israel right after Pesach, and then I come back and I go again. So there will be maybe a very long period of time with no lectures. We will have to see how I'm going to plan it. Okay, so Bezrat uh, Hashem, we spoke about... Uh, it's working? Everything okay? Yeah. All right, so we spoke about uh, basically... The, the world from the time of Adam until the time of Noah, for about 1,500 years, that the whole world had to keep six laws, six laws, shesh mitzvot. Then in the time of Noah, after the flood, Hashem gave him one more mitzvah, which is ever minachai, not to eat animals unless they dead first. This mitzvah was added to the six that he gave Adam. So from the time of Adam until the time of Noah, everybody knew there are six divine laws. And now when the time of Noah came, and after the Hashem wiped out all the wicked people from the world, and the whole world actually got restarted right after the flood, he added one more mitzvah, one more commandment, and it was seven laws of Noah. Besides the seven laws of Noah, Every Gentile until today must, is obligated to keep the seven laws of Noah. All religions and cults in the world are all fake. Not, none of them is from God. Not Christianity, not Islam, not Buddhism, not Hinduism, not Krishna, and 80,000 other cults and fake religions. It's all baloney. None of them came from God. It's a story, made up story by one individual. Nobody ever witnessed the beginning of the religion, if it was ever from God. Unlike Judaism, that was in front of millions of witnesses, and everybody heard the voice of God speaking to Moshe in a, in a public event, and right away then they received the Torah, and everything that is written in the Torah, it's what happened to them in the last year. In Egypt, all the miracles, the exodus of Egypt, the opening of the Red Sea, the Ten Plagues, the miracles that are happening now daily in the desert are all described in the Torah, include the part that it's written that all of them heard the voice of God in Mount Sinai when we, when we got, when we have the revelation of Hashem for the first and last time in history to a group of millions of people. Everybody saw, everybody heard, you cannot fake such thing, cannot deny such thing. That's why the fake religions and the cults who came after did not try to deny the, the truth of Judaism. Uh, Muslim Christians say, yeah, of course, God gave you the Torah, you're the chosen people. Muslims say that, Arabs say that before Islam, Arabs admit it, Christians admit it. Even in their books it's written, in the Quran it's written that Jews are the chosen people. God took them out of Egypt, brought them to the promised land. It's all written in the Quran. It's so the same thing written in the New Testament. They never tried to say the Jews never got the Torah in, in front of millions of witnesses. 
unlike their fake religion that nobody ever witnessed the beginning of it, Muhammad came from nowhere in a desert and claimed he got the Quran. How many people saw it? No one. Even according to him, he was alone. Go and believe someone who tells you a story when nobody ever saw it. Plus, it's against all the rules and all the regulations. The prophecy already ended 700 years before Muhammad was born. There was no more prophets. Before that, there were prophets every generation, many. There are 48 Jewish prophets, seven female Jewish prophets, and seven Gentile prophets. Plus, there were many, many other prophets that nobody knows today because their prophecy was for individuals, not for the public. For instance, as he read in, read in the Torah that Joshua went to the tent and he saw the two brothers, Eldad and Medad, receiving prophecy. Anybody knows in the world Eldad and Medad as prophets? If it would not be written in the Torah, nobody would know that some people receive prophecy but was only for themselves, not to pass to the public. We don't care about those thousands of prophets that we had that receive prophecies that were individually made for them or for a small group of people. We're not including them. We only include the legendary main famous prophets that are accepted by all the people, include Islam, include Christianity. They all admire Isaiah and Jeremiah and Joel and Amos and all of these prophets. Nobody denies their, their, you know, their, their prophecy. So everybody accepted Moses and all the prophets that came after and the judges and the king. Nobody denies it. Judaism end in songs of songs. That's 24 books that are all divine. Five books of Moses and 19 more books of the prophets, the judges, the kings. 24 all together, that's the Tanakh. Everything that came after that, it's all fake. The New Testament full of human errors, ridiculous human errors, does not even have one tiny percent chance that it's divine. Usually when someone comes and tells you something is divine, you give it at least one percent. You say, you know what, maybe there's a chance. Maybe there is something into it. Let's test it. After testing Christianity carefully by thousands of thousands of scholars, it leaves zero doubt that this is definitely not the book of God. Definitely, because it's full of human errors, contradictions, non-stop mistakes that in 11 of kindergarten. So something like this, <laughs> excuse my language, you have to be super, super foolish to waste a second of your life on this fake religion. Why is the Christians love it so much? Nobody wants a life without holidays. They want gathering, family, they made up all kinds of stories, trees, Yoshke, December 25th, all these stories are all fake. His birthday is not December 25th, New Year's Eve, it's nothing. Uh, it's all mamash, one fake on top of the other. But they want to believe it, it makes them feel good. It's tradition for them and that's it. My Muslims is different. They copied uh, many things from the Torah. They are more strict in the religion, as you can see, they're willing to kill and to die for their book, even though it's not one word of there, it's from God. Not one word. It's also full of human errors, full of contradictions, mistakes, very ridiculous mistakes. You know, there's a good film in YouTube who shows all the mistakes in the Quran. You don't know if to laugh or to, to cry. One place they say one thing, and another place they say the exact opposite. Non-stop. So we don't want to waste time on those books. We know the book that everyone agreed, the Jews got in Mount Sinai, Christians agree, Muslims agree, Jews agree. They got the book from Hashem, and that's the book that gave the Jews 613 commandments. Most of the commandments are only in effect when the temple is standing in Jerusalem. 2,000 years, there's no temple. The second temple was, de was destroyed by the Romans. And that's almost 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years since it happened. And since then, the prophecy stopped. The last prophet was Malachi. This was 700 years before Muhammad. 
nobody, there was no prophets. Every generation there were many prophets, but from the destruction of the second temple, no more prophecy. That's why that story that Muhammad is a prophet can never be, because it's against the rules of the Torah and God doesn't contradict himself. Plus, plus, he's not even Jewish. He doesn't even know how to read and write. What was holy about it? You know, well, he doesn't know how to read. Did God would give prophecy to someone who doesn't know how to read? You're out of your mind. Someone is completely analphabetic. But, as, as you can see, this scam worked. And we all suffer from it. Everywhere you go, you suffer from it. That scam tortured the life of millions. Jews, Christian, even Muslims. Everybody suffer because of that fairy tale. And that's it. And we will continue to suffer until Mashiach would come, or we'll put an end to that scam. To the rest of the scams as well. But until then, we're going to have to live with these fake beliefs around, and propaganda, and all the lies, and the made-up nation, the Palestinians, who there was no such nation ever. And everything, all their lies, one lie on top of the other, until one day will all explode in their face. But until then, we have to suffer from them. That's a part of our tradition. It's written that Ishmael, the children of Ishmael, which is all the Arabs, will torture the children of Israel before the end of days. It's written. Nothing you can do about it. So we live, we live in the middle of it. Now, once the Torah was given, the Gentiles in the world still have to keep the seven laws of Noah and every commandment that is required by common sense. Not everything is written for them. For instance, they have the seven laws of Noah, fine. But what about respecting their parents? Does it say that Gentiles have to respect their parents? No. It's not written. Why? Because it's needless to say. It's common sense. You have parents, they raised you, they took care of you, they paid for you, they brought you up. You have to give them respect. You have to respect every human being. You have to respect your parents more than strangers. For that, you don't need God to tell you that. Every normal person, even the animals understand that. Even the babies <laughs> admire the parents in the jungle. So the, you don't need to come to tell the goim every little thing. Just that you don't have to tell them you're not allowed to eat sand or you're not allowed to eat uh, poison. They know it, with or without Torah. Plus, not to be violent, it's common sense. Not to make the streets dirty, it's common sense. Not to be a cruel person, it's common sense. Not to torture animal, it's common sense. I once did a calculation how many commandments the goim have to keep based on what's required by human being common sense, is around 60 something mitzvot, together with the seven. So it's not so simple. They do have some things that they have to keep. You know? Many of the Gentiles, they don't know that when they actually perform an abortion, it's 100% a murder for them. It's against the seven laws of Noah. A non-Jewish doctor that perform a, an abortion res, will receive a death penalty for that. If not in this world, in the next world. So as many babies he aborted, for each one of them he will have to be executed. And again, and again, and again, and again. Remember, over there there's no limitation of one-time death. I will explain. In this world you can only kill a person one time. That's it. Once he died, he died. You can shoot him another 5,000 times. It's not going to kill him more than what he's already dead. Once the soul came out of the body, he's dead. You shoot him again. Is it going to make him more dead? No. But in the next world, after God separated the soul from the body, the body went to the ground, now the soul went up to the court of heaven. And the verdict was reached for Jews and non-Jews. If they go to heaven, heaven of Jews, or heaven of Gentiles, or they go to hell, hell of Jews and hell of Gentiles. And there are things that are worse than hell, such as kafakela and all kinds of reincarnations that can mean animals and, and, and raw material and plants. There's all kinds of punishments. 
But Jews and non-Jews, they come back sometimes as regular people. They have another chance, another lifetime. They're born in a new body and they have uh, X amount of years. And once they died, another trial. And then God decides, does he send them again in reincarnation? Or this time no more reincarnation, they send them to hell, and the hell is cleansing the soul from all the sins. Every sin a person commits makes a stain on his soul, spiritual stain. These stains cannot be removed with water and soap or showers. This is spiritual. The, the soul is something spiritual. It's a divine energy. The, the, the dirt is all spiritual. It's not physical dirt that you can remove stains. The only way to remove the spiritual stains is in a place called hell. Hell, it's fire. Fire, for instance, if you want to clean silver, that's the way to do it, with fire. The question is, how do you apply fire on something that is not material? Fire can burn wood. Fire can burn plastic. Fire can burn uh, wool. It can burn papers. It can burn a lot of things. But how does fire burn a soul? How does fire affect the soul? So here we have to understand that a person, as, as you know, is a combination of a body and soul. And the body suffers physical tortures in this world, right? Can be, can be beaten up, can be whipped, you know, with a, with a, with a whip, can uh, have all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of pain, headaches. It's all physical thing. What does it mean spiritual? Spiritual means you don't need the body to suffer. I'll give you an example. If you take a person right now with his body and throw him into the fire, he begins to scream, ah, for about a minute or two, and he dies. Usually even less than a minute. After X amount of seconds in a fire, the soul must comes out of the body. The minute the soul comes out of the body, there's no more feeling. It doesn't feel pain anymore. The body continues to burn, but the soul is already released, flying in space and watching what's happened to the body. He sees his own body is burning, ashes. But he's wondering, wow, look at the wife, look at the children, all my friends, they're all crying. But I'm flying above and I don't feel anymore any pain. The pain was for about 30 seconds. Once the soul comes out of the body, the entire nerve system is shut down. No more pain. All the pain that you feel is only when the soul is in a body. When the soul is not in a body, there's no pain. However, sometimes there's such thing called clinical death. The soul goes out of the body, a person is dead for a few minutes, and then the soul comes back into the body. For the few minutes that the soul was out of the body, the person is getting burned, or he just got crushed by a truck in an accident, he didn't make a beep. They try to revive him. Electric shots, oxygen, people scream, cry. He doesn't feel any pain. Why? The soul is out of the body for a few minutes. The second the soul is get sucked into the nostrils back again, the soul enters the body through the nostrils, as it's written in Genesis 1, God created Adam's sin from the earth. And he blew into his nostrils a living soul. And a person became alive. Three steps. First, there is a shape of a body. It's all material, made from sand. Then the soul goes in, attach all the sand together, the divine soul. And after that, the person is alive, he has a spirit, he understands, he remembers, he has feelings, emotions. This is all the soul. How does a person die? It's written. And the soul of Rachel came out, the wife of Jacob. And she died. What's that? Exit of the soul from the body. That's death. It's also written in the Kohelet, King Solomon. And the soul will return to the master that gave it. And the body will return to the sand that it came from. 
And there's another verse, you came from the ashes and you will go back to the ashes. So, so there is no dilemma here. It's very, very clear. One, two, three, three, two, one. That's it. That's how you become alive and that's how you die. Oh. Now, when a person goes to sleep and he wakes up after two minutes with a huge nightmare, screaming, crying, his pulse is 200, his blood pressure is higher now, he's sweating all over the bed, he became very red. His wife is checking him up, you okay? I never saw you like this. Don't ask, I had a huge nightmare. And he began to describe a real disaster, tragedy, one tragedy after the other that happened to him. The problem is that he was only sleeping for less than three minutes. It's not even 200 seconds. That's it. One, two, three, three minutes, it's over, finished. But the story with the conversations that took place is six months. Six months. How did six months of events with, with sailing with a boat in the middle of the ocean for weeks, being stuck three days with sharks in the middle of the water, in the middle of the ocean, getting beaten up, by kidnappers, it's such a story, six months of hell. How did it fit in less than three minutes of sleep? There's no room in, on a disc. The, 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 the sleep was only three minutes. How in three minutes you fit conversations that took weeks and months? Conversations take time. How did it fit in a regular speed in three minutes? A very big question. If you sleep an hour, the nightmare could maximum should be an hour. If you sleep three hours, you can have three hours of nightmare, meaning story, I fell into a hole, I was there for two hours and 59 minutes, finally the snake didn't beat me, and they threw a rope, and I climbed up, and I came out. When? Three hours, exactly the time I was asleep. So that makes sense. Three hours you were sleeping, the torture was exactly three hours. But if you slept two or three minutes, and now you describe tortures that took six months straight, how did it fit in three minutes? The answer has nothing to do with the sleep. Once you go to sleep, a part of your soul exit the body. That's why in the morning when we wake up, first thing we say, I have to stop before the last two words. What does it mean, translation? I thank you, God, and also admit. Thank and admit in the Shona Kodesh, in a, in a divine language, is the same word. Mode and Mode. Modem means I admit, modem means I thank you. It's interesting, because they're connected. You cannot be a grateful person with denying God, or denying his principles, this is what I'm going to talk about now. As soon as you deny some of his principles, you're becoming an ungrateful person. There is no way to be bought, it's a contradiction, right? So, so what's going on over here? A person that so he goes to sleep, and he wakes up in the morning, he says, I thank you, God, and I also admit and confirm in front of you, what? A living king, existing king, that you return my soul to me with mercy, right? With mercy. The... the the faith, the, the, the confidence that we have in you is huge. So we thank you, we admit that your soul is in your hand, you took it, you, pu you put it back every morning. One day you may not give it back. You don't take it for granted. Some people go to sleep and they don't wake up. Now what happened to the soul when the soul, when a person is asleep? The soul goes up to the court of heaven reviewing the entire day from morning to night every good and bad thing you did 
everything has been analyzed, it's like a, like a court date. And you have to sign in the end on the daily verdict. It was a positive day, negative day, Hashem is happy from you, is disappointed from you, is angry at you. Every day you sign and confirm. A part of your soul goes up to the court of heaven and confirm what happened and, and it's going into your file. The file is not only from this life, it's also from your past life. Your soul could have been in a body before you came with this body. Now your name is uh, Moshe. In your past life your name was Jacob. The life of Jacob was 75 years. Every day of the 75 years is all signed and sealed with the signature of the soul of Jacob, which is the same exact soul of Moshe. The soul never changed. The box, the body, the image changed. The soul is the same soul. The soul continued to sign on every lifetime. In the end, they put it all together. This is your journey from the minute I created your soul until the end of days. Now we're going to reach a final verdict. So we have a lot of different court dates. First, every day. Then every year, Rosh Hashanah, the annual verdict, the annual trial. For all people, Jews and Gentiles, every Rosh Hashanah, first day of the year. Then when we die, we have a one year trial, one year. That's why we say Kaddish for one year on the deceased people, for one year. And then there will be a final trial in the end of everything. Who will get his share to the world to come and who is not. So there are few already different dates of verdict, of mishpat. One of them, the most frequent one, is when we go to sleep every night. A part of the soul go up, review everything. The other part that remain in the body absorb and uh, categorize all the information that you learn today, whether it was at work, whether it's in yeshiva, the Torah you learn, it's all settling in the brain. Just like when you finish uh, an, an upload, then they ask you install, right? You have to click the button install. It's not enough just to download it. Now you want to install it on your computer. So that's the install. Until now you're receiving information all day, speaking to people, learning, uh, at work, at school, in university. Then it has to settle in the brain. That's why you need to sleep at least six hours to get all the information recorded in your, your brain fully. If you don't sleep enough, you may lose parts of this information. The memory will be affected. So you need to sleep at least six good hours, you have to sleep healthy. If you get up a lot, it distracts the transaction. Sleep is a very important part in the life of a person. You cannot sleep too much, it's not good, but you cannot sleep too little, unless you're one of these holy, giant, big chachamim, like the Gaon Mivilna, David Amelech. They, they, they were in a very high level, they didn't need. Everything by them was fast fast forward so now when the soul goes up to the to to the court of heaven you know it's analyzing everything together in a court signing going back when he wakes up Hashem push back the soul into the body and you're able to wake up when a person is asleep you see he's limited he cannot listen he cannot function he cannot answer He's not aware of what's going on. Why? Because it's partially dead. Partially dead. Because it's partially dead, when there is a dead body, it's right away becoming pure. Someone died, the body immediately becoming pure. If it's a coin there, he must run out of the room. He cannot come in a room where there's a dead body. Why? Because dead body, immediately when the soul or part of it leaves the body, impurity goes in instead. So what happened in the morning? We we'll have to wash our hands from the bad spirit. We should have also washed our legs because the bad spirit is holding to our nails. And where we have 10 nails in the hands, 
and ten nails in their toes. Why in the nails? Because Adam, when Hashem made Adam, it was perfect. First of all, he was huge, bigger than a mountain. And it was all made with nail, not flesh, skin. It was made with a nail. And he shined like a diamond. The sun reflected on him. It was an unbelievable creature. And he was not supposed to die. Supposed to live forever. Nails, you can keep it a million years. It will remain. It will never get spoiled. Nails. It's very interesting material, the nails. So once, uh, once the, the body was actually nail, not flesh, what wasn't skin, it's, it can live forever. It's, you, never, you never get old. You never get rotten. You never get discolored. None of these things. After Adam committed the sin, he became small, and the nail switched into skin. It's written, Vayas Lahem Kutonot Or. Hashem switched his body from nail to skin. Skin dies, become wrinkled. The older you get, the worse it gets. But he left a memory of what we used to be. And this is in the edge. And the edge, a little bit left to remind us who we used to be. And the Satan is an angel that Hashem created. His job is to make a lot of negative things in the world. To fight against Torah, against rabbis, against holiness, against modesty, to promote heresy, to help the heretic, to publish their garbage everywhere, to hunt a lot of people and bury them that they should not have a share to the world to come. That's his job. He's also in charge of the even inclination. He's in charge of all the desires. He's, a, he's technically a very good matchmaker, the Satan. He knows every human being what bad traits he has, what weaknesses he has, and based on that, he brings to him obstacle every day. Someone that cannot control his appetite, get him all the time around food that he will eat non-stop and swallow and fress and go crazy about food and eat non-kosher and the rest of the stuff. Someone has a, a, a weakness with women all the time. Women, this, fix his hair everywhere, party, inviting him here, inviting him there. Come for a drink, it's been a long time since you came. The Satan is making a perfect matchmaking between weak characters to desires that exist in the world. Someone that is not greedy for money, the Satan cannot fool him by running to rob a place or to steal. <laughs> he has no anger for money. He's happy with what he has. He doesn't even want to go to work. I am I'm happy with what I have. So, you know, even some of his father said to him, come on, come, I have some money for you. Come, let me give it to you. No, no, I'm okay, Dad. I don't, you don't need to. I'm good. You have people like this. It will be very difficult for the Satan to convince someone like that to go and steal money. If you don't have desire for money, why would you go and steal, go against God to take something you don't even desire? But if it's food and you have weakness for food, that's where the Satan got you. Ah, it's no big deal, the meat, it's good. Santa is the mashgiach. He made sure that it's kosher. The mashgiach from Bukaraton or the clown from Englewood, he supervised the shechita. Ah, but he has a beard. Okay, we can count. It's okay, it's kosher, eat. Then you eat refot all day. And why is it? Because you have desire for food which you cannot control. Someone who has no desire for food, doesn't want, doesn't even like meat. It's going to be very difficult for the Satan to fool him to eat non-kosher meat when he doesn't even want to eat meat to begin with. Needless to say, when the meat is most likely not kosher. You get the point, right? Everyone has weaknesses. That's why we came to the world. If we were perfect, we didn't have to come back. So the Satan is a great matchmaker. He make matching between people. Also, when there are two people who wants to steal, he introduces them to each other. He always makes sure they will meet somewhere, in a bar, in a sport game, in a party. 
Why? He will help him with the te technological uh, assistant. This guy knows how to break. This one knows how to drill. They always find each other, all these crooks. How is it? The Satan is a great matchmaker. So this is just to give us a, an idea what's going on. So now, when a person dies, the body was just buried in the ground. There's no more body. Well, how are you going to burn a soul in hell? There's no body. Soul, how can a soul, how can a soul be burned? Now the answer is, Rabotai, it's a simulator. Just like in a dream. When you go to sleep, you're burning now in a dream, you scream, you're all in bed, ah, I'm sweating, your blood pressure, your pulse. It takes you five minutes after your wife woke you up to catch your breath. You cry, people cry in a dream. People scream in a dream and people can even die from a heart attack in a dream. That's how bad it is, it's real. It's 100% like in reality. In a dream, you're getting burned and you feel like you are burning now, right here. You feel like your body is burning. Or when you fall from a building or the plane is crashing, you scream, oh my God, please, I don't want to die. It's 100% real. So in, in this experience that Hashem wants you to feel, He also decides how long it would be. Regardless of the time on this earth, the time of air is physical. This is a spiritual time. It's, it's time here exists only where material exists. That's the famous, famous theory of Albert Einstein, who was proven to be true. He took the scientists seven years to admit, that's called cognitive dissonance. When your brain catches it right away, but you refuse to surrender to your old beliefs. Meaning the brain and the heart does not work in the same speed. In the brain, you know right away what's the truth. But then the heart resists. For, for instance, you just saw the person you love the most died in front of your eyes. The brain knows that that person died. You saw him being buried. But for months, every time someone knocks on the door, you hope it's him. Why it's going, how? how? You, you know that he's, he was already under the ground. Why are you still hoping that he's by the door? Because it takes slower motion. Emotionally, it takes a lot longer to digest the tragedy or even when something good happened. It's all a lot, much, much, much longer process. Same thing when someone proved you wrong. Your entire life was a mistake. Someone just proved to you that you're a secular, wicked person ungrateful to your maker and now one second in your life you actually touch the truth whether you're a Jew whether you're a Gentile you're going against your maker you don't keep the laws you don't care you're ungrateful you never pray you never thank God for anything you do a lot of horrible things thinking no one is watching all of a sudden you just realize your entire life was all mistakes wow how many stupid things I've done thinking nobody's watching so the point is, okay, now you've just found out, you know, but you still resist. Why? You have the desire, the comfortable feelings. How can I let go? How can I change my uh, personality now? How can I be a different person? I got used to this lifestyle. It takes years. Albert Einstein already said, time exists only where material exists. Why? Because it depends on the speed of Earth and the galaxies, the light, or everything. That's what makes time. Speed, the speed of the galaxies and the Earth and the rotation of the Earth, 1700 kilometers per hour. That's what creates 24 hours every day. If the speed of the Earth would be faster, instead of 1700 kilometers per hour, it will be double, 3,400 kilometers per hour. Day and night will be 12 hours. Six hours day, six hours night. If it will be slower, day could have been 40 hours, 50 hours. Depend on the speed. Seasons depend on how quick the Earth rotates around the sun. 
a full circle is 365 days and few hours. If you change that speed, summer instead of six months or four or three months would be seven months. Winter could be two years. But then the entire earth will be messed up. Your photosynthesis, the plants, the fruits, the vegetables, everything will be messed up. People will die from depression, like in Iceland and Norway, North Pole, all these areas. People kill themselves because it's very, very depressing. Six months darkness, cold and dark. People don't want to leave. Places of sun, look, a lot of people move to Florida. Why are you so happy in Florida? I don't know, I can't explain. Another person that goes and sits on a beach every day, or sit in a boat, he didn't even get a boat. What makes you so happy in Sodom and Gomorrah? A place that people walk naked in the middle of the street. You go into the elevator and your religious children see naked women standing next to them, in a building, in the streets, in the supermarkets, in a pharmacy, in a parking lot of the building. You know, it's not just on the beach or by the pool. It's everywhere. People walk naked on the street. What religious person wants to live there? The sun, the sun. I hate the weather. So the weather will make him lose his olam haba, the weather. The weather. How to believe? Why? People love the sun. They love light. Some people, if you shut the lights in the house, they get depressed. It's very interesting. The entire thing will change. That's why Hashem designed it that the year will be 365 days and that the day will be 24 hours. Everything is exactly like the Torah. In the Torah you have a cycle of a year. And how many weeks you can have and how many chapters you're gonna read. Divided to 52 weeks with the holiday. It's all exactly as the Torah of Hashem. Why you have fingers? Because you need them for the, for, to practice the religion. Why you have an arm? Because you need to put fill in. Why you have eyes? Because you have to see and to learn and to understand. Everything is based on what was written in the Torah. Why you have parents? Because you have a commandment, you should respect your parents. If you didn't have it, you didn't need to come to the world from parents. You could have grown a tree. A tree has a, a nice, nice fruit is growing, 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 becomes very heavy, boom, detached from the branch, falls on the floor, crack like an egg, and a little midget comes out and begins to walk and grow by itself, just like the deer, just like the monkeys. Nobody has to nurse him, nobody has to teach him. Birds, everyone, everyone the animals, they learn everything on their own. A minute later, they're already walking. Hashem could have made us like that. He has no, no limitation. Why does he need a father and a mother and there's so many rules? Who comes first here and who comes first there? Pa father, mother, genealogy, your religion, your, uh, you know, nationality, from the mother, from the father, all of these things. It's a part of the religion. So, that's all a simulator. Just like when you sit in an Air Force simulator and you feel exactly like you're flying an F-16. You see Tel Aviv, you see the building, you see the highways, you see cars moving. If they made a simulator, one million percent precise. Precise! Mamash unbelievable. Every tree, every leaf that you have in Tel Aviv, you see in a simulator. You know, when, when I, you sit in a simulator, it, it looks like the cabin of the F-16. You have the stick, you have the gas, and you begin to fly. Then in one minute, for you from Tel Aviv, you're already in the in south, in Be'er Sheva. In one minute, shh, it flies, it can fly faster than the speed of sound, which is one mach. I think it's 1,100 kilometer per hour. Speed of, of sound, speed of light is uh, 300,000 kilometer per second, per second. Speed of light is a lot, a lot of, of, of the sound is a lot slower. That's why when uh, you sometimes see a lightning, only 10, 15 seconds later you hear the thunder. But it came out in the same second, just that the light travels a lot faster. So you see the bright light already arrived to you, 
but the, the sound is still traveling. It will take a few more seconds until it will arrive, that's it. But it happened in one crash. Boom! Electric explosion, and it sends a wave, it sends the lightning, and sends the thunder, much the same second. But they travel in different speed. At night, if you speak at night, your voice is double, it's higher. If you speak outside with your friend, right here on the street, if someone stands 20 feet away from you, he can hear you. 21 feet, he won't hear you anymore. Up to 20 feet, he can still hear your conversation in a day. Without cars on the street, without traffic, very quiet neighborhood. 20 feet from here to the door, he can still hear you. At night, he will be able to hear you from 40 feet. Same loud conversation, same, same exact volume. Why? Because during the day, when people talk, they have uh, waves coming from their mouth, right? Sound waves. Sound waves. And sound waves, during the day, the waves of the sun are cutting them, slowing them down. Because it's contradiction, it's like, like the cross. You have waves that go from right to left, and then you have waves of the sun that come from the top to the bottom. So they penetrate. So what happened? The voice that comes out of your mouth, having obstacle. It cannot travel that far. That's why people that are too far in the day, they won't hear you. But at night, there's no light. Nothing, out, nothing is cutting the, the voice of the, of the waves of, the, of coming out of your mouth. So it can travel faster, I mean longer. It goes further. It's all mamash, unbelievable how much they made every little detail count. It's unbelievable. You change one tiny detail in a creation, you mess up the world. Completely. The whole world you messed up. Because it's a chain reaction. Do you know that sometimes you have a hurricane in uh, Thailand, in Japan, I don't know, those tropical places, a hurricane, a tsunami. This tsunami that you see right now, the hurricane or typhoon, started a year or two ago with the shake of a butterfly wings on the other side of the world. The butterfly that flies, created some kind of energy who start to travel and accumulate and become more and more and more and more until it gets to a situation that it becomes, it's called the butterfly effect. Effect a parpar. Parpar means butterfly. Who would believe that a year later these tiny things will become such a massive wind, can knock down houses? It's very, very difficult to understand. Bechlal, whatever you see in a material world is all an illusion. Did you know that? We live in a world of illusion. Everything you see doesn't exist. You see a huge building in Manhattan now. A hundred flights. Huge, massive, the whole block. This entire building massa is less than one piece of rice. Take one piece of rice from the bag. This entire building, masa, is less than one piece of rice or bean. How can it be? You can fold the entire material of the world, combine it together, the masa of it will be like a red gum, like a round gum. The entire world. What do you mean? You have mountains, you have <laughs> buildings everywhere, you have houses, you have highways. What do you mean? This is all real. Concrete, solid, rocks, stones, metal. The movement of the atoms are so fast, more than you can imagine. There's no words to, to even describe the speed of the atoms. It creates an illusion. I'll give you an example. You have a fan now. Fan. The fan has two arms, four arms, like a shape of a plus, right? Two and two. So it's four. If you press slow speed, you see how they roll, right? You see four, but they're rolling. 
if you increase the speed, you put the fastest speed of the fan, you don't see the four anymore. It looks like a full circle. What, what, what about the space between the arms? There are spaces, right? Here. If this is the, this is the, right now, the fan, right? There is space here and space here. It rolls so fast, we don't see any more the space. You see one full circle. You can't even put your finger there. If you put your finger, you will cut it off. Why? Because now the movement is so fast that it actually looks like an illusion, like you have a real full circle when you don't. Now when you have a building, you take the amount of, of, of atoms that you have in this building, when you have bricks, you know, you bring metal, they move so fast, it fills up the space, but they don't really exist. It's unbelievable. We obviously don't have the way to even analyze such a thing in our brain. Try to understand a little bit of what I'm saying. But the movement of all the neutrons and atoms in the material is so fast that it creates an illusion like you have a huge beam, a piece of wood, or, or a big truck, or, or a huge building. It doesn't really exist. It's just movement so fast. But you can walk there, you can put couches there. Why? Because everything moves so fast, it fills up the place. It's much like you have a full, like you actually have a full building. <laughs> so technically, why Hashem did it like this? Why Hashem didn't do a static material without movements of electrons and atoms? Without movement. Static. There's no life in, in raw material. No life. Hashem could have done it. Why does he need that every raw material will have movements in it, in the ingredients of it, that they are constantly moving inside? You cannot see it with a regular eye. But why did he need it? Because once you begin to learn physics and about the world, you come to a conclusion, exactly what the Torah told you. You're so in love with this world. This world doesn't even exist. It's such a fake illusion before you realize it will be over. There's nothing you can take from here to the next world. So I want to show you that even what you think is real, which you really right now, you own it. You bought a building in Manhattan for a billion dollars. This entire building is a bunch of movements of atoms that they move so fast, it doesn't really exist. Of course, in this world, it benefits you, it serves you, you have a place to sleep, you make money, okay. But in reality, it doesn't even exist. But the soul is divine, it's eternal. It never get decreased, it never get old, it never loses the, the, the abilities that it has, because it's divine. That soul goes up when we die and Hashem decides What's the verdict? If he decides that a person has to go to go to be in hell for 500 years, 500 years, until all the stains that are on his souls will be clean, then he send him to a special place. There are seven different sections in hell, Shiva Medore Genom. And according to the sins, that's how each place cleans the soul. Not all places are the same. Different kind of fire, different, mamash different. If you read Masechet Genom, you'll be shocked. It's mamash like a factory. Just like the Nazis, Imach Shimam had in Auschwitz, all different kinds of punishments for the Jews. Same thing over there in El. So now, but there is nobody. How do you burn a soul for 500 years, just like in a dream? Remember in a dream, you go to sleep for, for 5, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, and you wake up with the suffering of 6 months, actual suffering, screaming, crying for 6 months. Oh my God, I can't take it. Oh, you open up your eyes. Wow, it was all a dream. <laughs> but it was reality. Right now, you're back to a different world because you see your body laying in bed in the air condition. You drink water, you relax, the nightmare is finished. 
How long was the nightmare? Three minutes or six months? Six months, 100% six months. Six months. Same thing the Torah says, that the person is not where his body is, where his mind is. Technically, you can see now in a synagogue, someone sits over here, but he's not really here. He's not here. Where is he? Where his smartphone is taking him to? One guy is now talking to someone from Japan on his email. Another guy reading the news. So he's now in the office of Sleepy Joe. That's what he reads right now. One mind is staring at me, one guy, but his mind is in what he had tomorrow to do in a business. That's where his mind is. One girl is sitting over here is thinking, wow, will I be able to go home on time today to put the kids to sleep? Or maybe the nanny will put them to sleep. Should I leave before? Should not? Her mind is with the kids now. What are they doing? I wonder if the new nanny, she knows what she's doing. I'm worried, the babysitter. Everyone is where his mind is. He can be sitting in a yeshiva, but his mind is on a beach. On a beach. He can be on a beach with an ear, earphone on his head and listening to Gemara Shiur. Sleeping, getting tanned. And his mind is in yeshiva now. He's listening to the record, recording of the shiur that took place yesterday in yeshiva. It's mamash there. He see the walls, he see the books, he see the face of the rabbi. That's where his mind is. A person can be with one person intimately and his mind is thinking about a whole different person. According to the Torah, that's already cheating. Why it's cheating? He wasn't physically with someone else. Where the mind is, that's where you are. That's where you are. If one person thought that he's with one girl, thinking this is Rachel, and in the morning he found out it's a different girl, and she conceived, that's called Ben Tmura. The kid is, came out from this woman, but was created with the other woman in the mind. That creates a lot of problems in life. That's called Ben Tmura. Tmura means Hamara, to replace. You replace something with something. Someone fooled you. He gave you a fake bill for, for a real one. You give someone a hundred dollars, he gives you five twenties, real twenties. You give him one uh, hundred bill, fake, fake. It's not real. This is called Hamara. So there are many examples like this. After we learn all of that, now the conclusion that we have to understand here is, so therefore nobody can run away from Hashem, everything is recorded, Ein Ro'av, Ozen Shomad, V'chol Ma'asecha Basefer Nichtavim, everything is recorded, everything, audio, video, there's not one sneeze that you had in your life that will not be analyzed. Everything. Jews and Gentiles. Even Gentiles. By Jews, the demand is higher, the reward is higher, and the punishment is higher. It works both ways. Jews can charge interest from non-Jews. Can charge them interest, give them a loan, charge them interest. Jews also allowed to pay Gentiles the interest. It works both ways. It's a two-way street. It's not discrimination here. Yitzchak lended money to Chris, charge him, I don't know, 15% interest a year. Next year, Chris lended money to Yitzchak, charge him also 15%. Both transactions are legal. Jews can charge interest from non-Jews, non-Jews can charge interest from Jews. Why? They're not brothers. It's two different nations, different genealogy, different family tree. The Torah say, do not charge interest from your brother. But remember, there is a comment here. Remember what I said last week? Every time the Torah says brother, achicha, reacha, amitcha, all these words, is only a Jew that is Shomer Shabbat. Every Jew that is not Shomer Shabbat, according to the Jewish book of law, is not considered a Jew. 
Therefore, if you gave him a loan, if you charge him interest, you didn't break the rules. It's count, it's count like a non-Jew. Of course, we don't do it. We don't want to do it. If we did it without knowing, okay, what you did, you did. At least you did not commit a sin. But lechatchila, to begin with, you don't want to give a loan to a secular mechalel Shabbat, charge him interest, even though it's allowed. Because what are you going to do if a month or two later will become religious? Become Baal Shuva in the middle of the loan. Then from that moment on, you're not allowed to charge him interest. What are you going to do? Yeah, I don't have the principle to pay you back. We said it's a loan for one year. I have ten more months. Yeah, but you're not paying me interest. You became Shomer Shabbat. I cannot charge you interest. Until now, you were like a non-Jew. But now you consider a Jew, you became Shomer Shabbat. I cannot continue to charge you interest. Give me back the money. I don't have it. I'm sorry. We made a contract for one year. It's a problem. One of the reasons we don't like to do these things is because some Jews are considered in Okot Shemishbu. They don't really know anything from their life. Nothing whatsoever. They grew up like non-Jews. They raised them like non-Jews. They don't know how to say Shema Yisrael. Many Americans are like that. In Israel, it's hard to find people that completely don't know anything. Maybe in a kibbutzim, some in Tel Aviv, but most Jews are connected, traditional, they have relatives, friends, religious people in a building, synagogues, every block. You cannot say I didn't know about religion. You cannot say I didn't know there's such thing Shabbat. Or I didn't know there's a holy Torah. Secular people in Israel, eight out of ten when they see Torah on the streets, when they do Achnasat Sefer Torah, they come to kiss. Meaning they understand that this, this book has a special value. They don't kiss the phone book. They don't kiss the newspaper. They don't kiss the dictionary. But when they see the Torah, they come and kiss. So what do you see? That they are hypocrites. They know the Torah is divine, they know it's holy, they know it's the book of God, they just don't want to know what's in it. The more I know, the more I will have to keep. The more I will know and not keep, the more guilty I will feel. It will ruin my quality of life. That's why the less I know, the better it is. I won't feel guilty, I will enjoy my sins. That's a calculation of a moron. A pure moron. Only morons think like that. Why? <laughs> not knowing the law does not dismiss anyone in the history from the punishment. <laughs> you just killed someone. What are you going to say to the po police? I didn't know it's not allowed to kill. No one ever told me. I laugh at you. I didn't know you're not allowed to steal. I didn't know you're not allowed to break into someone's house without permission and sleep there. I didn't know. You didn't know. You're going to jail. Doesn't matter. Here, what are you going to say to God? I didn't know. You can fool him. He will say, yeah, but you had all the time in the world to come and find out. You saw so many people around you living by the book. Living, speaking, screaming, demonstrating, protesting. Protest everywhere for Shabbat. Fighting, getting beaten up, not to let people break Shabbat in the neighborhood. Never occurred to you to check what they're giving their life for? What's going on over here? The answer is, of course, he knew. He just doesn't want to keep. So the less I hear about it, the less suffering I have. Someone that is cheap, he doesn't want to go to a place where poor people come to collect. Why don't you come? I have my reasons. It's not going to tell you. Why it doesn't come? Because 50 poor people will come, sir, can you, can you help me out? I'm hungry. He will feel guilty. He's cheap. He doesn't want to give a penny to anyone. But then he goes home and he suffers. What kind of a low life I am. People don't have what to eat. I sleep in a nice home. I have money. And they begged me for food. And I didn't even give them $5 to any one of them. So what's the solution? I never go there. If I go there, it will create conflict in my mind. You cannot run away from the truth. You only postponing the verdict. But you cannot run away from it. The longer you postpone it, the worse you will get. If there was a way to 
cheat Hashem, to lie to him, to deceive him, like you can do in a court here. No, we understand that, fine. At least, you know, there's a way around it. I'll take my chances, but there's no way. It's all documented. Nobody can run away. So the faster they will adjust their lifestyle to the divine book and instructions of the Creator, the faster they'll get saved from what's waiting for them. They can laugh all they want. They can make fun of the righteous people all they want. In the end, at Akol Yavi Hashem Bamishpat. In the end, everyone will have to pay for every word that came out of their mouth. No one can run away. That's why I said to you last week, when I see these wicked people in Israel, how they fight the yeshivot, how they fight the religion, how they cooperate with our enemies and helping them to destroy us. And you're wondering how Hashem can stand such people like Bernie Sanders and the rest of the, rest of the low lives. You have many of like him in Israel, sitting in the Knesset. Traders, original traders. So the question is, how does God give them oxygen? Ari gives them a nice home in Tel Aviv, private, garden, nice car. Salary for life they get. Politicians, dirty people, corrupted, fakers, traders, ungrateful people, thieves. Every negative thing you have in them. How can they even survive a second? How Hashem is not allergic to them? The answer is absolutely allergic to them. But his allergy and our allergy is different. He is perfect, therefore he can handle every situation you want. Any. We can't. Or he can break our spirit. He can make us kill someone. He can make us kill ourselves. He can make us go into depression. Certain things in life can destroy the mind of a person. Destroy him. Cannot function after that. Hashem doesn't have these issues. He doesn't get depressed, he doesn't get broken, he doesn't need uh, pro, uh, uh, Prozac, he doesn't need to smoke grass to relax every day. He's perfect no matter what happened in the world. He was perfect before there was any world. And he will still be perfect after there is a world. <laughs> Nobody can elevate him or lower him. There is a verse, Tnu Ozle Elokim, give strength to Hashem. Some fools, who their level of learning in Torah is like first grade, they call themselves speakers, they translate it literally. Why? Because they are in a level of first grade or kindergarten. What does it mean, give strength to Hashem? Hashem is the judge in the court of heaven, and the Satan is the prosecutor. The nation of Israel commit billions of sins every day, billions. The Satan takes the scenes and come, I want the Holocaust. I want October 7. I want thousands of bodies. These people don't deserve to live. These traders don't deserve to live. These Mechalele Shabbat were supposed to be dead a long time ago. Doesn't your Torah say Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat? We just read it on Shabbat. Shabbat, we read it in the parasha, Kitisa. Satan is building a case. Comes the Michael Sar Israel, the defense angel. He said, Look how many yeshivot, look how much Torah, look how many righteous people you have. Look how, how many holy people you have. They give their life for Hashem. You want to wipe up this nation? You want to wipe them out? You want to kill uh, Rav Kook? You want to kill Rav Ades? You want to kill 5,000 others like this? That's what you want. So there's an argument. So we have to give strength to Hashem, meaning the judge has to make a fair verdict. We have to do good things. And once we do good things, such as charity, for instance, we give tons of charity. Charity is the katatzil mimavet. If we give charity, right away, Michael Sar Israel come and saw objection. Look at the Jews, they just gave a billion dollars this last week to needy people, to miserable people, to the soldiers, to people that their houses were burned. Look how much unity, look how much chesed, look how many wonderful things there happened this week. That gives Hashem strength to be able to resist the request of the Satan. 
spiritual, in the judgment. Not that Hashem is limited. He needs you to give him strength. He cannot pick up the watermelon. Come, let's help him out. No morons. Dumb people. That's what they teach. Here, Hashem needs us. You see, it's written, Tnu Oz Le'elokim. I don't know if to laugh or to cry. I really tell to tell you the truth when I have to deal with such fools. Fools! They don't deserve to be students. Forget about speakers. It's written, Tnu Oz Le'elokim. You call yourself a rabbi in yeshiva? This is what you teach? You teach the Torah literally? Literally, this is how you teach Torah, literally. Might you reform? Reform, they try to understand the meaning of the words, literally. Not that they care. They still do the opposite of, of what the Torah say, literally. But that's the way they understand it. It's written, Hashem has a face. We just read in Shabbat, Parashat Kitisa, Moshe said to Hashem, O dieni night kvodecha. Hashem said, I cannot see my face, but you'll be able to see my back. But one of the 13 principles of Judaism is that Hashem doesn't have an image. And anyone who imagines God in any form or shape or color is a heretic. It's against the 13 principle of Judaism. Now, when the Rambam wrote it 900 years ago, the 13 principle, the Rambam knew the Torah by heart, every word, much better than all the rabbis in the world today. There's no question about that. The greatest rabbi in the last thousand years, together with Rashi. So if Rambam writes the 13th principle of Judaism, and one of them is that Hashem doesn't have any image or any shape or any, and I cannot imagine him in any way, but it's written in a verse that Hashem said to Moshe, you can't see my face, but you can see my back. That means that there is a different meaning to this conversation. Because every fool knows what's written here. You don't need to be a genius to understand simple Hebrew. But if the Rambam tells you God doesn't have an image, but it's written that you cannot see my face, you can see my back. So does he have an image or he doesn't have an image? Hashem said, Nobody can see me and stay alive. So I'll tell you the secret of it. Tomorrow in the lecture in Brooklyn I'll speak about the parashah, so I will speak about it deeply. When Hashem comes and says to the people, nobody can see me and stay alive. If Hashem doesn't have an image, then what is it to see? What's to see? If there's no image, you don't even need to waste the verse in the Torah, uh, nobody can see me and survive. There's nothing to see. Do you get the point? If you say, nobody can see me and survive, Meaning, there is a way to see me, but I will prevent it. Because if you will see me, you'll die. I don't want everyone to die. So then from here we learn that there is something to see. But that's not what the 13th principle says. It says there's nothing to see. Hashem doesn't have an image. So what does it mean? The Zohar say, the Zohar say, Ki lo irani adam v'chai. nobody can see me and survive, stay alive. בחייהם אינם רואים, אבל במותם כולם רואים, שנאמר, לפניו יכרעו כל יורדי עפר. Translation. In their life, nobody sees God. But in their death, everyone sees God. As it's written a clear verse, in front of him, everyone bowed down on his way to the grave. On the way to the grave, Everyone bow down to Hashem. What do they see? If there's nothing to see, okay, I want, I want to bow down to Hashem, but where are you? I don't see anything. I, I don't know how. <laughs> From here we learn the literal explanation is there is something to see. The Rambam come and say, and Chazal say, there's nothing to see. Even if you imagine letters when you pray, it's against the Torah. Light against the Torah. White color against the Torah. A, bi a, a big image in the sky with a nice white beard against the Torah. This is all heresy. It's written. El mit damiuni ve'eshve. 
anyone you trying to imagine me like it, it won't be me. No matter what, meaning from here we learn that all the images that we are used to and we saw in our life, that's not God. Mean, it means that he has a spiritual image that we can never see. But in the next world, we will be able to see something. Otherwise, he would not waste a verse and say, nobody can see me and survive. If there's nothing to see, why are you warning me that if you could see me, you would die? That's philosophical, deep questions. Maybe tomorrow I'll have more time, I'll talk about it. But going back to what I just said. So we got the concept of how does the punishment take place when the body is really actually in a grave? How does the soul receive physical punishment? I explain all of that. Now I want to conclude, we don't have that much time left. I just want to conclude quickly because I'm finishing the series today. That's it. It's a three lecture series. So I just want to conclude finally to speak about the, the principles of the Torah and shortly for everyone to understand what they must know every second of their life. Jews and non-Jews. This principle also applies to non-Jews. It's different obligation. But for instance, if a non-Jew wants to become a Jew, he wants to convert. First question in a bad din will be, tell us the 13 principles of the Torah. And explain it. And if he doesn't accept one of them, he can never be a Jew. He can never be. Now you may ask, but there is some kind of a contradiction here. Okay, I'm Tony. I want to be Jewish. I come to the three rabbis in the Bed Din. I said to them, I admire Judaism. I love the Torah. I love God. I just don't believe in one of the 13 principles. What? I do not believe that the dead people, after hundreds or maybe thousands of years that they are in a grave, one day will come back to life. I'm a doctor. I went to university, medical school. I know that people don't come from the ashes, uh, from a skeleton and become people. I, don't, I just know it. It's not scientific. So I don't believe in it. You're allowed to convert him? You're not allowed to convert him. Why? Because there are clear verses in the divine book. I will open up your grave and I will put back your spirit back into the body and your body will grow ligaments and flesh and skins and muscles and I'll take you out of the grave, open up your grave, take you out of the grave and you all come back to life. It's clear verses. So if he is more academic than religious, he's a heretic. Cannot convert someone like that. Then Dr. Tony would say, but I don't, I don't get it. I have a Jewish friend, Dr. Mark, Dr. Abe, Abe, Abe Cohen, Dr. Cohen. He's just like me, and he's religious. He goes to the synagogue in Brooklyn, put filin every day and pray. He comes to Shomer Shabbat. He also doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Why he can be Jewish and I cannot? Good question, no? My discrimination? If you say that in order for you to be Jewish, you must accept the 13 principles of Judaism, if someone refused to accept it, then, then, then you announce him as a non-Jew. That's a big problem. Someone like that is an apicores. You cannot count him in a minyan. He's right. Tony is right. You cannot count a Jew like this in, an, in a kosher minyan. Like a Jew, he's an, he's an apicores. Let me read it to you instead of believing what I say, I'll read it to you. The first foundation is to know that there was the first existence before everything else existed. And he is the founder of everything. And he invented everything. And everything you see was invented and created by him. And all their existence is only thanks to him, nothing else. They don't have any existence of their own. They cannot benefit each other. Uh, product one, benefit product two on his own. No. The only way they can benefit each other, help each other, complete each other, work together, is only thanks to him and thanks to his supervision and abilities. 
Without him, nothing can work. Without him, there's no creation. And without him, the creation cannot function. That's the first foundation. Second one, this master of universe is the leader of the whole world. An unlimited strength and ability whatsoever. Doesn't have even a drop of weakness or something that is incomplete about him. And his strength never get lower ever, even by a tiny percent. It n there's no such thing, fatigue by him, I need a rest. Let's take an hour rest. The world should go easy a little bit for an hour or two. I need to catch my breath. I work very hard today to supervise the world. There's no such thing. And there's no stoppage. And the wheel is always turning. And it can never turn without some energy who turn it. All the galaxies, all the stars, the rotations of each star, the movements, billions and trillions, every star is a thousand times bigger than Earth and turning and not colliding with each other. All their movements, all their temperature, all their energy is all coming from him. They don't have anything of their own. The sun, the sun temperature in the middle of the sun, the center of the sun is 15 million degrees Celsius. It's more than 20 million degrees that we have here. In 80 degrees, I'm fainting already. Imagine now, 100 degrees, uh, I don't come out of the AC. I can't breathe. I can't move. 100 degrees. Imagine 15 million degrees. 20 million degrees. 20 million degrees. And for thousands of years, it never went down by one degree, ever. Always the same, always the same. Where did the energy come from? What's the sun consume? It's a huge ball of fire. Fire needs to eat something. Wood, something to catch up to something. Fire doesn't have food, fire will die after a minute. Where this fire, this ball of fire, constantly creating heat and light to the world. And there are so many others there. Who does that? It's only Hashem. It's Yash Me'ayim. Constantly creating new energy. Constantly. For thousands of years. For billions and trillions of stars. Moving them. Creating energy in some of them. And then he found a little tiny ball. Smallest one. The Earth. And now he has trillions of trillions of options where to place it. Maybe here, maybe here, maybe here. There's endless amount of options. You know how big space is, right? Placing the earth somewhere in, a, in space, it's harder than placing a dime somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Imagine you have to place the dime in one spot only in the entire Atlantic Ocean. The dime compared to the ocean is not even a dot. It's nothing. You need to place the... Oh, there's only one option. From endless amount of options. That's nothing compared to space. You compare the ocean to the space. There is only one place that people would be able to live. All other options, they either will get burned in seconds or freeze in seconds. There's only one option that life is possible. And surprisingly, the, the earth was placed exactly in the only place in the right distance from the sun that can create life. How can there be so many stupid people that still say, ah, it was all made by itself? Random explosion, evolution, all kinds of stuyot. From endless amount of options, only one option will be possible. From endless, you know, endless mean, endless mean trillions and trillions and trillions and uh, until next year. Trillion multiplied by trillion, multiplied by trillion. Endless amount of option. Only one is kosher. Like you have endless amount of passwords you can put. 
There's only one password will open the computer. <laughs> you can put any combination you want, billions and trillions of options. None of them will open the screen. There's only one. And you have to guess it, and in one shot you guessed it. What are the odds? You have 20 digits now. Make up a password. Oh, are you crazy? 20 digits? That's endless amount of options. Guess. Okay, A, 5, Z, question mark. <laughs> oh, boom, bingo. People will bow down to you right away. You're the new God. You're the new Muhammad. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you are the new prophet. Who would ever be able to do such thing? Something like this can be coincidence. <laughs> now, that's only one tiny trick. You have trillions of trillions of tricks like this every second. For thousands of years. Miracle after miracle, non-stop by every human being, in every brain, in every heart. To come and say, I'm an atheist, you need to be hospitalized immediately in a mental institution and never see another day of light, if it was up to me. I would not let one atheist ever come out of the mental institution. Because that's where they belong. Because if someone would come and say, this was made by a random explosion across the street in a garbage can, look, look at the lines, look at the parallel lines. One cent, it was made by an explosion. Would, would you feel safe around such a monster? You want your daughter to date such a person? If your daughter say, Abba, I'm going with this atheist on a date tomorrow night, would you be able to eat your dinner when she's on a date with such a monster? Every five seconds, you okay? What's the problem? I'm very nervous. Why are you nervous? You went on a date with someone that claims such a claim. It's not a normal person. Who knows what to expect from him next? This is people that runs the world in a Supreme Court. This kind of people. <laughs> they sit and decide who would live and who will die. When they are the biggest danger to society. Mm. Professors in Harvard. No. The guy that sells the vegetables in Machne Yehuda is a million times smarter than you. He may not know physics or math in your level, or law, or medicine. He may not know that. He's not so educated like you. But he's not a moron like you. He won't say that the world was made by a random explosion. He would laugh. So who's functioning more? You or him? You, with all your degrees and academic studies, say that the whole brain was made by a random development. Billions of billions of explosions created a brain. And this guy that sells vegetables, 10 for one shekel, he screams in a shook. The professor laughs at him. Ugh, primitive guy. Look how barbaric, how he screams. Primitive, a million times smarter than you. When he hears the nonsense you teach in the university, he laughs. Your stupid student clap. Professor, can I get your autograph on your book? This book doesn't deserve to be a toilet paper. But that's the world we live in. One fool drag another fool and another fool. The question is, are they, these people that say that the world was made randomly by some explosions and billions and trillions of years of experiments and somehow everything connected together, do you really believe that there's one person that believe in it? You actually believe there is anyone that can believe such toyot, such nonsense? I personally don't think it's not possible. It's just not possible. Because when you tell, you know, one, one time one rabbi said, I went to a supermarket in Yerushalayim, and there was a secular guy waiting by the counter, and he screamed, anyone here? Does any, uh, anybody runs the store here? Shalom, yesh kan mishu? The rabbi told him, no, the store runs by itself. There's no owner here. He looks at him and says, ah, nice joke, rabbi. He said, no, no, it's not a joke. For years, the store, for 20 years, it runs by itself. 
See how the tuna cans, look at the pickles, everything got on the, on, a, on, a, on the shelf, the prices, everything organized. Look, the heavy stuff in the bottom, the light stuff on the top. Look how everything is aligned. Look how the shelf of Paramount, what do you mean, they run by itself? There was millions of explosions, and in the end, the supermarket came out, and the merchandise that came from Israel all the way across the ocean, and they arrived to New Jersey port, and from there it flew somehow to Queens, and it's right here by the deli, by the supermarket. Ah, Rabbi, I'm speaking of the words of you. He said, why, why are you making fun? That's how the store runs. You know, it's not possible. Enough! He said, your ear should listen to your stupid mouth. I told you the store runs by itself, you're making fun at me. But you said the whole world runs by itself. So who's dumber, me or you? <laughs> oh, I never thought of it. Lo chashavti al ze. Now you begin, Baruch Hashem, begin to think. So that's the second foundation. Nothing can happen here without his decision and without his will. So, third, this God is only one. And it cannot be more than one. Right here, Christianity goes right to the waste. There cannot be any divine entity. Only one. No two and not more than two. Right. Why? Because if you would have two gods, each one of them would be limited and subject to the other god's decision. If both of them are uh, omnipotent, um, um, how do you say that? Omnipotent? Omnipotent? That's the right one. If both of them call Yahor, they have no limitation, and can do anything, can create anything, imagine they fight now. They begin to go in a fight or a chess game. It will never end. It's because there's two perfect things. It will take forever. One wants this, one wants the other one. You know what would happen in the world? There will be a chaos. It's once there is another perfect God, the first one is already not perfect. Then the second one is not perfect because there's someone else that can affect him. So anyone that is subject to any other entity's effect is already not perfect. And the Torah say clearly that that's the perfect God, and he knows the future, and he runs everything, and he controls everything. If there was another God, then we cannot rely on the one God that gave us the Torah. Maybe the other God doesn't like the Torah. Maybe the other God promotes same-sex marriage. Now they're going to go into a nuclear war. I want men and men to get married, and I hate it. It's abomination. Who's to say the last word? Boom, the whole world will go on fire. It's, it's ridiculous. Don't get me wrong. We don't need all this philosophy. It's already written in verses in the book of God, and he's not a liar. But now we're analyzing it with our own philosophy and logic. Even if we didn't know that it's written in the Torah, we will still have to come to this conclusion on our own. So this God is one and not two and not more. There's one that is no one like him. Not from the people or anything that exists in this world and not from anything out of the world. Is not one that is connected by few, few that connected to one. One piece like a car. You have engine, you have transmission, you have a carburetor, you have sensors, you have wheels. You connect everything, it becomes a perfect machine. You take one wheel out, the machine is worthless. You take one wire out, you can start the car, it's not worth a penny. If you take one sensor out and there's nowhere in the world to get this sensor. This, this Bentley from 300,000 went down to three cents. Maybe you can use it as a tent. Maybe you're going to build a sukkah there. Cut the roof and put some branches. Why? Wow, you can use it. Wow, it's such a nice car. You cannot start it. And what good is that? So you mean, it means in order for the car to be perfect, it needs lots of pieces to be connected in the right places and in the right timing and to work together in a perfect harmony. That God is not like that, he's one. And there's no connections to him. 
or upgrades or pieces who got together to create that perfect supervisor. So, if there were many gods, then we would not have any control in any events. Nothing would be certain. There was no point of giving Torah when there is another superpower who can overrule everything that it's written over there. God said, if you be Mechalel Shabbat, you lose your eternity and you put to death. The other God would say, no, I disagree with this ruling. I want it to be like this. What are you going to do now? Follow the Torah or get the other God angry? It's not possible. So, he doesn't have anybody and he doesn't have an end. He will never die and he doesn't have a limit. And everything he does is with a very deep, smart purpose. It's this God, since he doesn't have any limitation and no end and no stoppage, he never stop in anything, everything constantly will always function and everything will roll forever as long as he wants. Therefore, his physic and strength is different than the strength of every creation that was made by him. Like our strength is subject to many things. If you eat, you will have time, you will have energy to walk. If you fast a week, you're not going to be able to move. Meaning your entire energy depends on other things. Even that is limited. It's subject to many different things in the body to function and other things that you need in order for you to function and to be able to talk or to walk. But he has no, he doesn't depend on anything. His strength is perfect will, or will always be perfect and nothing can ever affect it. He doesn't need any upgrade or he doesn't need any assistant to make him function the way he functions. So. The fourth one, since he's different than all the things we know and everything that was created by him, and his truth is different than any truth that we understand in our common sense in life, all the creations, meaning people, animals, or material, galaxies, sun, moon, all of that, they constantly depend on him. They need him, but he doesn't need them. To say that he needs someone, it's a huge crime, like Santa Claus said. Very big crime. He needs us. Just you use the word, God needs, it's already heresy. Any word, God needs, heresy. You an heretic, we cannot count you in a minyan. And it's not open for negotiation, and I don't care which rabbi will defend him. You understand? If someone comes to defend him, he's no better than him. He's the same heretic, and I don't care titles, and I don't care who, and I don't care names. Saying that he's a needy in any way, it's already kofer. You cannot count him in a minyan. He comes in, you have nine people, he comes in, you cannot take out the Torah. He can say Kaddish, you can say Baruch Hu. Find a kosher person. If not, you, you can pray by yourself. That's it. Ah, but we are ten. No, no, it's not count. He say God needs us. You cannot count him in a minyan. Anyone who follow the shtuyot cannot count them in a minyan. We don't have minyan. We don't have minyan. We anusim. Anus. Anus rachmana patri. But it's Yom Kippur. Doesn't matter. You cannot take a pikorosim, kofrim in Hashem and count them as regular Jews. You can't. It's against the halacha. We get to it soon. So all the creation needs him. But he, Baruch Hu, and not Tzarich Lahem. He doesn't need them at all. Lefichach, therefore, his existence and truth is completely different than their existence and their truth. Which is a whole different concept. This is the words of the Prophet, Vashem Elohim Emet. God is the truth, the ultimate perfect truth. By him, it's a perfect truth. All the truths we have in this world, it's always mixed with other things. His truth is pure and perfect and doesn't have any tiny reduction in the truth. It's 100% truth 
You can never be 99.9999%. There's no such thing. He himself is the truth. And there's no way to reach truth anywhere besides his truth. Meaning, any truth you reach in this world, as great as you are, you Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Akiva, you still didn't come even a bit near his truth. It's beyond and above any understanding. And this is what's written in the Torah, En od milvado, there is no other but him. En sham matzui emet milvado kmoto. There's nothing exists in, in existence that comes even near to his what he is. Five. Knowing this important big principle, the existence of the Almighty God, this was already included in the warning that God gave Adam the day he created him. Right from the beginning, which is, be careful never to worship anyone or anything. I am the only God. That's the first commandment. If you remember, I say he gave him six commandments, and then after the flood of Noah, he added one more. One, the first one was, do not dare to worship anything in the world, nothing. There's no Avodah Zarah allowed. The obligation to know it is not only to hear and to understand, it's to make sure it's in your heart and never leaves it for a second. It's to think about it all the time, to be careful never to give any divine power to anyone but God, never to admire anyone but God, never to give divine abilities to anyone but Him, never to count on anyone but Him. Look how many mistakes we do. This Rebbe, that Rebbe, this doctor, that. To look carefully, to become wise. About the existence of God and His greatness. That you, it will be constantly solid in your mind. And you think about him non-stop every second of your life. That's the ultimate goal. Shiviti Hashem le'negdi tamid. God is in front of me always. Someone that is in this level, needless to say, he doesn't commit one sin a year. Never. <laughs> Standing in front of God will dare to do something wrong. V'ze sh'amar David, Shiviti Hashem le'negdi tamid. King David reached that level. Hashem is always in front of me. And everyone that lives in this world, include Gentiles, is obligated to accept this commandment. And the, all the entire seven laws of Noah, of the Gentiles. Because God commanded them as well, before the Torah was given to the Jews. And they were informed again in the time of Moshe. Meaning, until Moshe, from Adam to Noah, okay. Then Noah, a second time that he informed them. And Moshe, it's the third time that now the Goyim has no excuses. In the time of Adam, they knew it. In the time of Noah, Hashem informed Noah. In the time of Moshe, Hashem informed Moshe to inform the Goyim. The problem is that 3,300 years ago, most Goyim have no idea what you're talking about. They don't know what the seven laws of Noah. This command to know the existence of the one God include to accept him on, uh, as a king on me in everything. Now, oh, of course there is a God. Oh, of course there's only one God. Of course he's a superpower. Of course he has no limitation. Of course he's not a needy. But keep me out of it. No, 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 it's not such thing. Every second of your life you must aim. You are my king and I'm your servant.
without you I'm nothing. כולל קבלת מלכותו ועול מלכותו. I am nothing, I'm under you, I'm in your hands, and everything I have is from you, and nothing can come without you. Six, everyone who accepts the seven laws of Noah and is careful to keep them, הרזה מחסידי אומות העולם, is a righteous Gentile. When he dies, ויש לו חלק לעולם הבא, and he has a share to the world to come. And also will get the resurrection of the dead. Some goyim will resurrect, and some Jews will not resurrect. So no, there's no discrimination. The question is if you're righteous and fulfill your obligation or not. Vu sheikabel otam ve'yase otam mipnei the the. It's not enough just to do it because common sense requires not to murder or to believe in one God or not to steal. No, no. Remember, we spoke about it in the first lecture. What is it? You should accept them because Hashem said so. Logic, not logic. Leave your head out of it. I am doing it like a servant to receive an order from his king. If the Gentiles do it because God said so, they are righteous and they go to heaven and they will resurrect in the resurrection of the dead. Wow. Just understand how many, how miserable the Christians are. Just believing in JC messed up their entire Olam Abba, the next world, the resurrection. They won't resurrect because they're all idol worshippers. Just because they believe in a, God has a son and he has power and he will save the world, that's already an idol worship. So, Rabotai, if a person did it because of logic, Rambam said it's not good enough. Better than nothing, but not good enough. Seven, anyone who think there is other God besides the real God, Areze Kofer Baikar, is an heretic, an infidel. Because knowing his existence and his truth and his specialty, it's a foundation that everything is depend on it. Thinking is a needy, messed up everything. That's it, you messed up everything. So someone that thinks, someone that doesn't understand the specialty and the existence of Hashem, and knowing there is only one God, thinking there are others, or that this God is not super perfect and he has needs, someone like that, who kofer baikar, Complete kofer, complete heretic. Cannot count him in any Jewish ceremony. Just like an Jew. Just like those goyim who bow down to the cow or to their idols. There's no difference between him and them. Even if he has a nice beard. The beard doesn't make you righteous. The question is how you act and what comes out of your mouth. Ve'achat kaze areze min ve'oved elilim. שכל מין הוא עובד עבודה זרה. המינים אין להם חלק לעולם הבא. Who are, who consider a mean? Someone who said there's no God at all. I'm an atheist, there's no God. I don't believe in God. Immediately he lose everything. Someone that said there is a God but there's more than one, like the Greeks. Immediately he lose everything. Someone that said there is a God but he's a body. He's in a body, like the Christians. Here, J.C. is the God, son of God. He has an image. He has a face. He is a special light. Someone like that is also a mean, loses everything. Someone that say, he's the only one now, but there was one before him who made him. Meaning there's one, made him, and he, I don't know, disappeared or died, and now he's the only one. But there was another one before, also loses everything. 
someone who worship anything but him, such a star, special signs, horoscope, the stars, or anyone that is a broker between us and God, like the Buddha. They don't really believe in a piece of metal. They just believe that God comes into this object and from here he's gonna run the show. Or the Indians that bow down to the cow, they think the cow is holy. It's all kinds of beliefs that through this, the God will reveal himself to us and do certain things. Someone that said there's no prophecy, that's the eighth principle. There's no prophecy. The, the Creator doesn't know the future. Someone that denied the prophecy of Moshe, Moses. Someone that said the, the Creator does not know what people are about to do, what they will do. Any one of them are as the Apicores, similar to me, also has no share to the world to come, you cannot count him any minyan. Someone that said these commandments are not from God. They just come and sense that the rabbis made it up. Moshe made it up. God never told him to say that. Or someone that disagree with any of the translation of Moshe Rabbeinu. What Moshe said and told us, he said, ah, Moshe changed it. it God really meant something else. You know, or someone said that the Creator replaced one commandment with another one, meaning there used to be one and he replaced his opinion, he changed his opinion. Like the Christians said, there's a new testament. The old one and now there's a new one. It's also considered an apicores. Like the Nutzrim, the Rambam writes Nutzrim. Clearly he writes Christians and he also writes Muslims. Muslims as well, because their entire religion is fake and lies, and they deny all kinds of things. Like they say God re replaced the Jews, they're no longer the chosen people. We have to punish them for what they did, and God left them. That's against the principles. There's a clear verse that Hashem will never leave the Jews and replace them with any other nation. It's a clear verse. S someone like that is an Apicores. If he was Jewish, you cannot count him as a Jew in anything. The ninth one. All the translations of the commandments that Hashem ordered Moshe Rabbeinu was all given by God to Moshe. And Moshe passed it to the elders and taught them all the formulas how to teach and to learn how to teach and to pass the Torah. And to those who sat in the Sanhedrin, the 71 special rabbis and prophets, and those are the written Torah and the oral Torah. Someone that follows Moshe, the Torah of Moses, must count on the Chachamim, on the Sanhedrin, on Chazal, on the rabbis, because they inherited everything that Moshe passed to them. Someone that disagree with what the Chachamim taught in the Talmud, what they say or how they, how they ruled in a special oral Torah, and they say, ah, that's, I disagree with the Chachamim, he is Apicores, Kofer Batora, you cannot count him in a minyan. Kol Aminim, Apicorsim, Vakofrim Shizkarnu, and Laim Chelek Laolam Abba. Those three categories of wicked people that we mentioned have no share to the world to come, include Santa and his followers. None of them. All of them are Minim and Apicorsim. That's why you cannot count them, definitely not allowed to invite them to speak or to even enter the shul. Technically, in the kosher shul, they won't let them in at all. Please go find yourself a different place. <laughs> not to talk about to come give a speech. This is Rambam, I write to you word by word. Someone that says Hashem is a needy, he has no right to tell me what to do, I owe him no apology. He has to apologize to us for making us, we didn't ask to come to the world. Not only is a mean and an apicorus and an heretic, he is also declaring a war against God, trying to convince more people to join his stupidity and war against the Torah. I don't know how so many blind people are cooperating with this scam. I don't know what's going on here. 
But they bring it on themselves. In the end, they cannot say that I didn't warn them. As it's written, the Rambam says, This wicked will go down to hell. Sheol is one of the seven places in hell. Kol goim shochechei elokim. All the nations that forgot the real God. That's where they're going to end. Kegon, min, ve'apikores, ve'afilu she'lo avdu avod azara. Even if they did not worship an idol, they go to hell for disobeying those principles or contradicting them. Shachichu et ha'ikar. They contradicted those principles. Eleven, someone that refused to accept on himself Bnei Noach, the mitzvot of Bnei Noach in the land of Israel, cannot stay there. If he goes somewhere else, it's his problem. If he insists to stay in Israel, you're not allowed to keep him alive. He has a death penalty and the court have to execute him. The court of the Gentiles. Because one of the seven laws that the Gentiles might, must make a court and police and ruled the seven laws of God to all the nations. And if they refuse to and they rebel against them, they can In every country, the Goim have to do it. But in Israel, if they continue to do what they do, idol worshiping, and they refuse to accept the seven laws, then the Jewish police and court have to take care of business. Any other way, that's the problem. They have to make their own court and, to and make sure to enforce the laws. But you don't rush to kill them. First, you warn them. And if they will repent and accept the seven laws, good. And if they insist, you do not let them continue with their evil actions. few more principles that we have to know that there's the concept of reward and punishment. Someone who denies that God punishes is also one of them. Is contradicting the principles of God. Therefore, we have a lot of modern people today, speakers, that teach and they have no right to teach. They make a big damage by teaching the public and tell them there's no such thing punishment, Hashem is merciful, He doesn't punish, the Holocaust was not a punishment, we do not know why. Any kind of speeches like this, it's all heresy. One of the most important principles in life is Hashem reward the righteous and punishes the wicked. And if you say otherwise, even a bit, you are an heretic. You also have no share to the world to come. You also cannot be counting a minyan. Look how many speakers that you probably know by name, you can't even count them in a minyan. Forget about to listen to the garbage that they teach. There is no such thing, there is no punishment. All the Torah is full of punishments. All the Torah is full of warnings about punishments that will take place for those who don't keep Shabbat, or worship idols, or steal, or many other punishments to contradict hundreds of verses in the Torah just because you want to be popular, you'll be criminal. Anyone who tells people otherwise than what's written in the Torah is a huge criminal. He modifies the Torah. Everyone who wants to hug the gays and take pictures with them and put pictures on his Facebook page bragging that he came to support them is a huge criminal, like the clown from Englewood. He's a very big criminal. Because someone who fears God and loves God will never dare to come one step near them. This is the people that makes God the angriest in the world. And the Torah is full of tragedies that come to the world when people commit abomination. It's clearly, the Gemara is full of examples how many national disaster, natural disaster comes to the world from this kind of behavior. So anyone who supports things that are against the principle is a wicked person. Now go and figure who is kosher. In America, look what's going on here. Look what's going on here. I'm finishing here. I mean, there's a lot more to, to be told, but I'm finishing here because, you know, 
people think they know everything. They hear uh, a series that's called the uh, foundation of faith, principles, or, ah, I already know it. I promise you nobody knows anything. Those who think they know the principle, what we taught in the last three lectures, eight, nine hours of uh, Torah, most people don't know what we taught. I believe that if people would listen to those three lectures carefully, first of all, I would never have to tell them about my blacklist. They would stay away from these wicked people like they stay away from poison, from fire. Right now, you still have to keep convincing people. Why this one is on your blacklist? You have to send him sources. Why this one? How can it be? You have to send him sources. Usually, everyone agree after I send them the sources. Once in a while, you have a person that is biased. It's not objective. He's a student of this guy, or his friend, or, you know. He, his goal is to save him, you know. So we don't care about people like this. They're not objective. They're not, the truth is not standing in front of their eyes. We only care what's written. That's it. Doesn't matter uncle, cousin, friend, best friend, wife, husband, brother. It's not relevant. If not, my brother will save me from hell, and not the wife, and not the friends, and not... If I will go against those principles, I cannot be called a kosher Jew. Cannot count me in a minyan. It doesn't matter how many years I'm Shomer Shabbat. For the Shabbat, I'll get my reward in this world. If I'm a heretic, if I say God is a needy, it's not perfect, he needs us. He was alone, miserable, poor God. He needed entertainment. If I speak in such a way, then I declare a war against him. Definitely I lost my share to the world to come. What about the kosher food I eat? What about the Shabbat I keep? What about maybe he reads Tehillim here and there? Maybe he gives Tzedakah. I'm sure he does good things. No wicked people do only bad. Some wicked people do good things, even every day sometimes. Even gangsters in Israel, they give a lot of donation. There's one murderer in Israel, the head of the mafia, he took a huge tender full of gifts and went to the soldiers and started to give them. Hundreds of shekel each pack was given to the soldiers. Mass murderer, blowing up people's head, big gangster, in and out of jail. Police are dying to put him in life in prison. Why? He did wonderful things for the soldiers when the war started. That doesn't make him less of a murderer. Let's make no mistake here. Someone is an idol worshiper and he comes to visit the orphans and play guitar for them in a hospital, in a cancer department. This is a very nice, good deed. No contradiction. When he does good, he deserves good. When he does horrible thing, he deserves what the Torah says. The problem is with the principles. None of us is perfect. We all commit sins, Lashonara, maybe food, all, all kinds of things. I'm not talking about committing sins here and there. If you eliminate everyone who commits sins here and there, no one will survive. No one. We're talking about someone that contradict one of those principles. That's the buildings of everything, the, the poles, the foundation of everything. With the foundations, you don't play. If you have a building, one window is missing, one wall is peeling, uh, one, one apartment has a leak, the building is still standing, kitchen is broken, uh, the light doesn't work in one room, it's not the end of the world. But if they have 13 poles, they're holding the entire building, and you take out one, the entire building collapses to ashes. This you have to remember from these lectures, these three lecture series. And you have to watch it again, it's not enough. Watch those three lectures and memorize everything. Make yourself notes. Your, your eternity is depending on it. Hopefully, Bezrat Hashem will benefit a lot of people. One announcement, people who wants to donate with Bitcoin, we have this option now. Someone set it up. It's good, a lot of people make tons of money now on Bitcoin. We can give their maser. 
click of a button, send it, we can save some souls with that. ברוך אדוני לעולם, אמן ואמן. רבי חנניה בן הקשיא אומר, רצה הקדוש ברוך הוא לזכות את ישראל, לפיכך הרבה להם תורה ומצוות, שנאמר אדוני חפץ למעלה.